Remnant 2 is hard, brutally hard, but with the right items, you can delay the inevitable and hopefully push further into the game. My name is Kodiak, this is Legacy Gaming, and today we're revealing all the secret ways you can cheat death in Remnant 2. Death. It's pretty much the name of the game. A poorly timed dodge, an overwhelming swarm of enemies, or simply an unexpected roll off a cliff. And while we can't help you with that last one, we've put together a list of some of our favorite items in the game that'll help you cheat death and take home the W. While this isn't intended to be a build guide by any means, you can pick and choose what complements your build best, and hopefully it'll give you enough of an edge to move forward in your progression. If there's something you feel we should add to the list, we'd love to hear your thoughts, so drop us a comment down below. We're gonna start by hunting down a few items tied to the Cathedral of Omens on Yesha that when combined, bring a little something extra to the table. More on that shortly. The Cathedral is its own puzzle, but as with most things in Remnant 2, the items associated are their own set of puzzles and secrets. Up first is the Ring of Omen. This ring has a direct effect on your evade ability. Instead of using stamina to dodge, it converts 14% of your max health to gray health. This may sound immediately concerning, but keep in mind, there are plenty of exceptional builds that rely on low health or managing your gray health, and just like stamina, your health is only depleted when in combat. Step one is honestly the most frustrating part. Your fate is tied to RNG in that you first need to roll the Cathedral of Omens tile set. I can't tell you how many times we re-rolled Adventure Mode in hopes that this would spawn, but we did eventually find it. Based on insights from the community, it's pretty clear that this is most often found just off the starting Forbidden Grove tile set but we've also seen it spawn much further away. It's all about patience at this point, so be prepared to reroll multiple times. Once you do get it, head to the central chamber and the giant shadow puzzle. To solve, simply pull the main lever once. Then head to the right side of the room and pull the lever four times. The door directly behind you will open, revealing two treasure chests and a red plate on the floor. While multiple chests are nice, it's not what we're here for. What we need is directly below us, and to open the red plate, well, you need a blood moon. That's right more waiting. Triggering a Blood Moon is all about timing. The only way to activate it is by moving between Yesha zones, hoping the timer will trigger. The exact timing triggers here are unknown, so you'll just have to experiment. If you think you've cracked the code of the Blood Moon, we'd love to know. Do the community a solid and comment down below. While we won't dive into it here, there are some other benefits to the Blood Moon phenomena, which we highlight in our Summoner Archetype Guide, so definitely check that out. When you do get that elusive Blood Moon, don't delay as it won't last long. Rush back to the cathedral and make your way to the rewards room we opened earlier. As you enter, the red tile on the floor will roll away, revealing a lower chamber where the Ring of Omens is located. As a standalone ring, this definitely has its function, but there is more to it than meets the eye. Located in one of the cathedral rooms, you'll find a lore book that calls out six amulets that directly correlate to this specific ring. When paired together, the wearer gains new evade functionality, a mist-like maneuver. This really is one of the most unique combinations in the game, and the direct impact on gameplay can't be understated. The most notable change is the transformation of your evade. When wearing this combination, you'll have access to a new Misty Step. This evade completely bypasses all armor encumbrance. That's right, no more slow rolls or flops with your heavy or ultra armor sets. You get the full defensive benefits from wearing these armor sets while completely avoiding all the downsides. Because of the ring, stamina is no longer the resource used for evading. Your health pool is. Each time you evade, your health pool will dip, leaving behind gray health. In and of itself, yeah, this isn't a great scenario, but paired with the right items that benefit from lower health or gray health, this has some incredible build potential. You can also think about other factors, like skills and lifesteal that could easily regenerate that health. Fortunately, you only need the Ring of Omens and one of these amulets to get this functionality, but we do go through them all as they each bring something different to the table and can be woven into different builds. We're going to start with probably the easiest to get, Death's Embrace. The amulet will grant a 20% damage buff when your health is below 100%, which, let's be honest, is a lot of the time. In addition, you'll gain haste when below 50% health. If you find yourself in low health situations often or you're trying to put together a low health build, this is a solid option. When you first roll a Yesha world, either in campaign or adventure mode, you're looking for the Forbidden Grove tile set. If this is available in your playthrough, it'll be the first zone, so if you see the red throne, you can simply re-roll until you get Forbidden Grove. Run down the stairs and you'll immediately come upon Betel of the Vaunt. Get through his bits of dialogue until you can browse his store. Open his wares and behold, Death's Embrace. Next, we're going after the Full Moon Circlet. 
This amulet allows range damage to lifesteal 3% base damage. When you're at full health, your range damage increases by 20%, which is absolutely nuts. Keep your eyes peeled for the Imperial Gardens dungeon. This is one of the more common tile sets we've encountered in almost all of our playthroughs on Yesha, so hopefully you'll stumble upon it quickly. To get this amulet, you're going to need the ever-important Blood Moon. Once it appears in the sky, wander into this beginning area of trellises that form a maze-like structure. You're looking for this statue of the Empress holding a piece of fruit. Walk up to the statue and the floor will roll away. Head down the ladder and pick up the Full Moon Circlet. If this is all you came to the Imperial Gardens for, you're all set, but there may be another item in this area that you'll want to pick up, if you roll the right tile set. Yes, that's right, more RNG. The good news here is that you don't need a Blood Moon. The bad news, you're still at the mercy of getting the right random dungeon injection. Speaking of injections, I want to take this opportunity to educate the community about this feature if you aren't already aware. Consider this a legacy learning moment, if you will. Injections or injectables are small additions to dungeons that can randomly generate in addition to the already random nature of the dungeon tile set. While there will still be a primary trajectory to the dungeon, other small rooms, chests, and mini bosses may spawn. We get a fair number of comments pointing out what we quote unquote missed in a particular section of a dungeon, when in fact, you simply found an injection that's random for everyone. Now, the Talisman of the Sun is located in a chest below a stone guard statue. In our run, this has typically been all the way at the back of the dungeon. Keep in mind, this is a specific injection, so you may not have this in your Imperial Gardens playthrough. The only way to really know is by trying to hunt it down. Due to the way the map is laid out, you pretty much have to travel the entire dungeon to figure out if it's there or not. You may be able to catch a glimpse of it from a few spots, but it's not super clear. Make your way through the dungeon, and if you're lucky, you'll begin to see this winding mess of stone ramps, stairs, and ledges. This is a good sign you've gotten the right injection as our stone friend is located at the top. Move through the area and pay attention to the terrain. Gaps and ledges become more frequent here, and if you're not careful, you'll fall to your death or have to start the hike all over again. I highly recommend grabbing the World Stone checkpoint located just beyond this area so you don't have to run all the way back through the dungeon in the event that you die. Once you get to the top, your reward is waiting for you in a chest along with a great view of the headache of a dungeon you just managed to traverse. As you're exploring the zones of Yasha, be on the lookout for the tomb-like dungeons, the Lament and the Twisted Chantry. Within these will spawn random injections, and one of those will contain the Necklace of Flowering Life, an amulet that increases gray health conversion by an additional 100%. When gray health conversion triggers, it'll produce five times mod power. This is another one of those areas that's RNG on top of more RNG. You first have to get the dungeon tile set, then you have to get the right injection. So search far and wide throughout each tile. We found ours specifically in an injection within the Twisted Chantry behind an illusionary wall. Once through, it was a long slog through arrow traps, pitfalls, and enemies, but at the end, you'll come upon a stone coffin with the amulet. These last two are easy to get and pair closely with the Yesha storyline. The Ravager's Mark will quite literally be the last story decision you make during the final world boss encounter on Yesha. When confronting the Ravager, you're offered a simple choice, kill the doe or fight the boss. To get the amulet we're looking for, you need to execute the doe and you'll be rewarded with the mark. That's it, no secrets to hunt down, no puzzles to solve, just a simple deadly choice. The amulet increases all damage by 20% to bleeding targets. If they have 50% or lower health, you get a nice 30% bump to damage dealt as well. Another epic piece for a great bleed build. The final piece of jewelry is another story progression reward, albeit a little more involved. To start, you'll need to begin with the Red Throne tile set. This is a starting area, so if you don't have this, just re-roll your adventure until you do. Speak with the Red Empress and make sure you're cordial with her the entire time. Basically, don't reply with anything that's defiant or threatening. Continue with the main story, progressing through Yasha as normal. Eventually, you'll end up in a tile set called the Widow's Court. Hunt around this area for a dead elite guard with an ornate key lying next to him. The item can spawn anywhere amongst the runes, so you may need to search around a bit. To find the lockbox itself, you'll stay in Widow's Court, but need to travel through the lower tunnels near the waterfalls. Towards the end of the channels and just to the left of a treasure chest is an illusionary wall. Move through the wall and follow the path, heading up the elevator until you reach the Queen's Chambers. There, on a the table, is the lockbox. This is what the Queen seeks and wants you to return. Do not use the ornate key to open it. Head back to the Red Throne and present the unopened box to the Queen. She'll graciously reward you with the Red Doe Sigil, which increases Relic Healing Effectiveness by 30%, which doubles when the wearer's health is below 50%. 
Now, there are even more secrets with the Red Empress storyline, so if that's something you're interested in, we have a video up on the channel outlining everything, so go check that out. With the final amulet in hand, that concludes our Cathedral of Omens treasure hunt. Like I said before, you only need one amulet paired with the ring, but now you have plenty of options to choose from. Misty Step is a great way to cheat an ill-timed fate, but if you want to truly master death, you need to take things a step further. The Mystical Thane Fruit quite literally allows you to cheat death, at least once. We have a full guide on how to get this in the same Red Empress video I mentioned earlier. The fruit can be consumed before an encounter and negate what would otherwise be certain death. When receiving fatal damage, you're brought back from the brink and granted a percentage of health to continue fighting. There are actually three tiers of fruit based on how long you let it ripen on the tree back in Ward 13, each increasing the percentage of health you come back with. Next is the Black Cat Ring. This does something very similar to the Thane Fruit. When receiving fatal damage, you just drop to one health. You'll get a 25% movement speed buff for 10 seconds that will let you reposition out of the heat of the action, the heal. This is an easy one to pick up and can be purchased from Reggie in Ward 13, but only after dying 15 times. This effect does stack with other things such as the Thane Fruit and the Die Hard Challenger Prime Perk. Since we're already talking about Reggie, you might as well pick up the Bright Steel Ring. This grants the wearer the fastest evade roll, completely ignoring your armor encumbrance. So you could be wearing something in the Ultra Weight class like Leto's Armor, benefit from all the resistances and damage mitigation, and still be able to evade as if you're in your underwear. Speaking of Leto's Armor, we have a great guide out there revealing some impressive early game secrets, including Leto's Armor Mark II, a familiar name any Remnant from the Ashes player should recognize. There's also an incredible evasion trait in the game, Fitness, that we think everyone should pick up. At level 1, this grants you 3% extra evade distance, while at level 10, it increases to a whopping 30%. There's no question this is going to get you out of harm's way quickly, especially considering most enemies have follow-up attacks that often catch people off guard. This trait is pretty easy to unlock. Simply head to Nerud and hunt down the Vault of the Formless dungeon. Keep in mind, you may have to re-roll a couple times for this to spawn. Fitness is rewarded so long as you or your team complete the last challenge, a gauntlet that takes place inside a massive robotics facility. Lastly, there are two ways to cheat death directly tied to your archetype choice. The Challenger comes equipped with the death-defying Die Hard Prime perk. When receiving fatal damage, you become invulnerable for 2.5 seconds and regenerate 75% of your max health, allowing you to get right back into the action for a second shot to victory. This is great, as there's nothing to really unlock. You get it so long as you slot the engram in your primary slot. Keep in mind that this is a Prime perk, so you only benefit from this if Challenger is your primary archetype. If you didn't choose Challenger as your starting archetype, don't sweat it. You can pick up the old metal tool from Reggie in Ward 13 and craft the Challenger Engram at Wallace. Finally, we have to talk about the Invader Archetype's starting skill, Void Cloak. When activated, you automatically dodge incoming damage for 60 seconds. Each auto-evade reduces the buff time by 30 to 100% based on how much damage is absorbed. Depending on the damage, the skill can negate anywhere from 1 to 3 attacks, which is insanely powerful. The decoy that spawns as a result of the dodge will also immediately hold aggro, allowing you to escape, avoid mechanics, or get in a small window of damage. Building around skill cooldown allows you to have a much greater uptime on Void Cloak, thus cheating death even more. If you've been looking for a second archetype or just looking to get your hands on the invader, we have a handy guide that goes into great detail already on the channel. Death can be a bitter pill, but with so many ways to cheat the Grim Reaper, I think it's safe to say we can delay the inevitable at least a little longer. Nothing is ever going to replace skill and practice, but at least for now we can say to the God of Death, not today. You better believe there's more to find in Remnant 2 and we'll be with you every step of the way, so if you appreciate all the work that goes into creating these videos, do me a solid, hit that thumbs up, and consider subscribing. It means a lot and goes a long way to helping out the channel. You could also join us on Discord if you want to hang out with the team, talk about great games, and enter for your chance to win tons of free prizes. That link, as always, is below. My name is Kodiak, and from everyone here at Legacy Gaming, thanks for watching, and play on.